Welcome, and thank you for joining us once again to Pilgrim Publications Presents. I'm Larry Wessel's co-host on this show as we examine the gospel of Christ in relationship to is water baptism necessary for salvation? Is church membership necessary for salvation? And in what sense? And questions such as this. And we're centering these kind of questions around a debate that took place in January 1991 between my co-host, Bob L. Ross, and a Church of Christ minister, minister of the Southwest Church of Christ, Bill Jackson. And uh, with that said, I'll go ahead and introduce my co-host right now, Bob Ross. Good to have you here, brother, as usual. And uh, as we continue, uh, the debate footage we're going to show, if you've been following this series with any frequency whatsoever, you'll realize that each week in this series we show a clip, basically an unedited portion of the debate itself that took place in January. It was a week-long de debate. There was hours and hours and hours of footage. No way to show all that in one sitting. Who's going to sit there for 10 or 12 hours and watch all that? So what we've done is I feel the only real way it can be presented in its entirety uh, to where the viewing audience can have an opportunity to see it. And also, with, in this format, me and Bob here can hopefully clarify some things for the viewer who may not understand certain points. Uh, if they were to tune in suddenly in the middle of the debate, they might be lost, per perhaps, on some things. But in this format, they can see the entire debate unedited and points explained in greater detail. So what we're talking about today in this particular uh, show of the series is we're on to the debate as it was held on January 24, 1991. It was the third night of the debate. It was a Thursday night. It was held at Kasurik Elementary School. And in this segment you're going to see, the minister at Southwest Church of Christ, Bill Jackson, was getting ready to come up, and you'll see this footage. He comes up to present his first speech of the, of the third night. And after him, you will see uh, Bob L. Ross's second speech of the third night. And uh, as we lead into this footage, you'll see, we're going to give you just a, a brief recap in case you're a first-time viewer to uh, lead you into this debate footage you'll see tonight. Uh, Bob, we've got a chart up here that <laughs> our regular viewers have seen it many, many times, and I'm sure the Campbellites who might, and for viewers watching, the Campbellite is a lexical term uh, representing uh, Church of Christ people. It's much like you use the word Lutheran, it would be representative of people in the Lutheran Church, uh, you know, and so forth. Well, the uh, Campbellites uh, probably are sick of seeing this chart already, but it's a good intro into just showing why this debate is so important, what's going on here, and how the gospel is, is related in. We have the question, as we've done many times, and I'll rapid fire through this so we have time to get into some of the things brought up in the debate footage. Uh, the question is, these men are restorers of the true church of Christ? The question asks, how are these men restorers of the true church of Christ? Well, they're restorers of the true church, at least by the Campbellite interpretation, because of, of their interpretation of Acts 2.38 and some other scriptures. Uh, these men being Alexander Campbell, the master spirit, and as they call him, and Walter Scott, the restorer of the ancient gospel, as they say, what is the ancient gospel? Bob, take it over from here and lead us right into... It's the other stuff we want to get into. Well, what we were trying to associate here in this debate was the fact that Bill Jackson is a member of the Church of Christ, which is associated with uh, various men and uh, publishing entities or colleges and schools and so forth, which have this uh, theory that the church apostatized, and then in the early 1800s, when the Campbell family came along, Thomas the father and Alexander the son, uh, they instituted a reformation work, which they called it, uh, supposedly to create Christian union, and ultimately it created Christian division. But at any rate, to make a long story short and get right down to the point, they uh, claimed uh, down through the years, their followers, that a restoration of New Testament Christianity had occurred. He claimed to have restored the proper interpretation of baptism, and he claimed to have restored the proper administration of baptism. 1820 to 23 for his so-called discovery, and 1827 
for his. Now, uh, as a consequence of what they did, supposedly the Church of Christ was restored. And uh, Bill Jackson, we have shown in his magazine, for instance, this issue here, we've been using to give front page attention to the Campbells and their claim about restoration. Restoration Peaks, this writer, Dabney Phillips, he's picking out some of the high points of the restoration history of the so-called restoration of the church. It's all centers around these men. Right. And uh, men like uh, Bill Jackson and Thomas Warren, Garland Elkins, uh, Roy Deaver, and uh, Noel Meredith and uh, Buster Dobbs, et cetera, et cetera, uh, maybe, I don't know, 50 to 100 of them or whatever that are in this spiritual sword fellowship, maybe more than that. It's a I, magazine. I'm, not, I'm not acquainted with all of them, but mm -hmm. at least uh, a 50 to 100 are well known by me by name because of seeing their writings. And they all assert that there was a restoration that took place. I have material here from Buster Dobbs, who writes for the Firm Foundation here in Austin, Texas. Well, it used to be here in Austin, Texas. I think they've moved it now. But Buster had uh, part of their teaching series was an article on the restoration movement. And then Bill Jackson, he has his class notes that he teaches at the Southwest School of Bible Studies that deals with the idea of the restoration of the church. And Earl West is church history, set of books. And on and on and on you could go. All this is in Church of Christ history books. And so what I've tried to do, is, I said, now you don't have to defend Alexander Campbell. I'm not asking you to defend him. All I want you to do is defend what you and these fellows have said have happened. You said that the church was restored. Now tell me how it was done. And give me something more than Garland Elkins flying a bird over with an acorn in its mouth and dropping the acorn down. And then an oak tree comes up because that doesn't tell me any detail whatsoever of how that has anything to do with Alexander Campbell and the restoration of the church or anybody else in the restoration of the church. Yeah. So uh, I was uh, fricasseeing him, so to speak, <laughs> with his own history. And of course, he was crying uh, about me not using scriptures and me not answering well, questions. Well, that gets back to the point when you used scripture with cultists, as we're affirming that they were cultists, mm -hmm. uh, your interpretation is never satisfactory to them what? whenever you use scripture. Well, it's like you were quoting Galatians on one of our recent programs. Yes. Well, now you had a whole chart here on Galatians, but uh, you know what they're going to say about that. Exactly. <laughs> they're they're, they're yeah. going to say, well, that doesn't apply. <laughs> and uh, so it's like they do, sometimes they'll quote a Baptist scholar. Mm -hmm. Well, they'll yank out a little bit that they want to quote, and then you can quote them something right out of the same scholar that contradicts the way they're using it. You know what they will say? They'll say, like Bill Jackson said of A.T. Robertson, they'll say, well, I can't help it if he's not consistent. Well, the fact of the matter is, the man's consistent. It's, You're talking about A.T. Robertson yeah, is consistent. A.T. Uh, Robertson's consistent, but Bill Jackson, or whoever the man might be, that misused him has made him look inconsistent. Right, because he picks and chooses right. little parts that he wants. Uh, you know, I can sit down here and I can pick out anything that a man wrote, maybe, if he writes enough, I can pick out a little here and a little there and mm. tack it together and I can make him contradict himself. How many times have you had, say, atheists say, oh, the Bible contradicts itself, mm -hmm. and then they'll quote a little here and a little there, mm -hmm. rather than seeing the unity of it as it truly is. Well, mm -hmm. A.T. Robertson, I've got well, quotation Case in point of what you're saying, you can take the example of a scripture that says, Judas went out and hanged himself, and then you take another scripture that says, you go thou and do likewise. Right, that's, that's exactly. <laughs> so you can say, well, the Bible teaches suicide. That's exactly what it is. You know, so so uh, A.T. Robertson, they'll yank a little here and they'll yank a little there. Why don't you take the whole A.T. Robertson? No, they won't do that. They'll say, oh, well, he speaks as a scholar here, but over here he's speaking as a Baptist. Mm -hmm. Well, now, who are they to make that particular mm -hmm. Distinction. I've asked a lot of them. A lot of these scholars they quote, how come they don't have big Greek scholars themselves? They're always yeah. quoting Baptist scholars and Presbyterian scholars and well, other scholars, but I don't really see a lot of big scholarly works by Well, Church this man here was their greatest scholar, and they're ashamed to quote him. 
because they know they can't defend him. Uh, because the man never was baptized in order to obtain remission of sins. Yeah, in fact, and so uh, consequently, uh, they can't hardly quote him because he gets them in too much hot water. Mm -hmm. It's like Bill Jackson trying to defend his baptism. He said, oh, they quoted Acts 2.38 at his baptism. Mm -hmm. But they didn't quote it in order to obtain, see, mm -hmm. because he claimed that he found that out in 1823, or at least that's, that's the first right. time he taught it. So they try to run for the hills when it comes to Church of Christ history, right. and then they, as a as a kind of a, a cover, they try to complain, well, you don't use any scripture, you're just quoting right. history. And, 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 and then this matter, you know, about the questions you mentioned. Well, the fact of the matter is, before the debate ever started, Jackson, you know, made the proposal with regard to the use of questions. Well, I've learned in my experience with Church of Christ debaters that questions is one of the ways they try to divert you. Now you've debated them for 30 years. Right. What was your first debate with the church? 1960 or 61. 1960 yeah, or 61. 60, I think. But anyway, it's a long time debating Church of Christ guys. Well, it, it's not been <laughs> continuous, understand. But anyway, I, I learned very early that they'll use questions to try to divert you off of the subject, and they'll also use questions in a rhetorical way. That is, they'll lodge charges against you and maybe lodge accusations or misrepresent what you actually believe mm -hmm. in their questions. Mm -hmm. And I had one in Baytown one time, as a matter of fact it was Buster Dobbs, and he had some, uh, I don't know how many questions he was going to use, but he was going to use up the whole time. And so finally I caught on to what he was doing and I said, look, I'm not going to answer any more of these questions, it's going to take up all my time. I won't have time to say anything. And so when Bill Jackson made the proposals with regard to questions, I said, okay, but only the questions that you read from the platform, and I didn't indicate at all that I was going to present any questions. Mm -hmm. I just was going to make conditions on his questions that he just couldn't slip me a list of 20 or 30 questions that I was going to have to answer when he wouldn't have to use his time reading them mm -hmm. from the platform. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he could ask a thousand questions if he wanted to, just as long as he used his time <laughs> right. to do it. And then uh, I could pick out the ones that were suitable to answer or reasonable to answer or applicable to answer. Mm -hmm. And so... So it's kind of a game they play with questions. Right. And, and it, you know, if you don't play along with them, just like they're planning, they get upset. And so that's what happens. And they try to him. make a point out of that. Oh, yeah. They, you know, they As say, we well, hear Bill Jackson romping and stomping. He's not answering my questions or he's not giving me questions. Well, right. I wasn't playing his game. Yeah. See, he had a little game fixed up. He wanted me to use up my time, get off on his tracks, mm -hmm. chase down little rabbit trails on where's mm -hmm. the name of the Baptist church in the Bible or where's this and where's that. And, That's right. And all this kind of malarkey. And I would use up all my time, which I was using to emphasize uh, the significant history. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you show That's that, verifiable. and when you show that these men started the history of this outfit, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about going back to the Bible. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's not in the Bible if these men started it, That's and right. this is where this interpretation started according to him. That's right. And if I can show that in history, why fool with? Yeah, because they don't accept your Bible, Bible uh, interpretation anyway. That's what right. brings us back to this thing about the Church of Christ. In order to obtain salvation, they say you must believe the Bible as the, well, you know, this is indirectly what they're really saying. I'm, I'm reading past what they say. They wouldn't accept this, but this is just a simple way to look at it. In order to obtain salvation, you must believe the Bible as these restorers, Campbell and Scott and others, have interpreted it for you. Otherwise, you go to hell. Right. Okay, now with that said, we've got four minutes left. He gets into something here that I think you want to answer. He talks about the Tottle Bank Church oh, yes. of Christ. Oh, yes. He gave, out, debate footage he, gave out this, uh, he gave out this brief history, he called it, of the Tottle Bank Church. Now, you notice they will uh, jump on you for using... Do you want to put that up on the chart? I can. They'll jump on you for using history or referring to history, but when they want to make a big point, they like to use history, and what do they do? They'll go to a Baptist church here mm -hmm. in England to try to make their point. And uh, I want you to notice what it says here. It says that this, was, this man that's writing this, uh, and by the way, this was written uh, sometimes later, he says, uh, this little church situated among the furnace fells has been described as the first 
Christian church in England. Mm -hmm. Now, you notice how vague this is worded, has been described. Well, who did it and mm -hmm. who described it as such? But you notice it doesn't say Church of Christ. Right. It says First Christian Church. Now, the viewers are going to see in Bill Jackson's arguments, he makes a big deal about this yeah, title, ba right. title bank church here. Now, you now, just all, remember this, what he's now, saying. <laughs> now, now all, all this proves is it was a church that was professing Christianity. That mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily used as a name, and that wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, excluding it as a denominational entity as such. Mm -hmm. It simply is referring to the fact that here was a group of people gathered in the name of Christ, and they were regarded in that sense mm -hmm. a church of Christians. Now, over here it says Christians and nothing else. Now, but on the next page, look at here. One thing on the next page, Larry, he tried to say this was the church of Christ. It says pastor of a church of Christ. <laughs> now, uh, you, want you better to, explain that to the viewers. What yeah. is the significance of now, pastor? They do not of a believe church of a church of Christ has a pastor. So therefore, uh -huh. how could this be a Bill Jackson type church of Christ since it had a pastor? Uh, so he would say this couldn't be a church of Christ right. because it did have a pastor. So but after, yet in a debate, so he's after careful a big examination point. of his own evidence, he says down here, it had been a faithful congregation of the church of Christ, and yet it had a pastor. <laughs> and he called that diatrophies in one of That's his speeches. That's correct. That's correct. So the here you have a, here you have a concrete contradiction by the fact they had a pastor at this Tottle Bank Church, uh -huh. or in association with it in the material he's used. That shows it could not be the Bill Jackson kind of church crisis. Just like that about. 1710 church sign right. that he was sticking up there trying to show that that was some kind of church of Christ. Exactly right. Now with a little bit of time left. Let's go ahead and go into our uh, debate footage right now. You will see it uh, as it happened that night. So, enjoy. Oh, we finally got him on the right night. <laughs> on Monday and Tuesday night, he was on Thursday night. We like to never got him on the right night. We're glad he he's finally settled down. You know, a newborn baby can get their days and nights mixed up just a little bit, and you don't know whether to spank them or to change their formula. Well, I'm going to do both, but I can use the same thing. The, what I spank with is the same thing I feed him, and that is the Word of God. We'll just increase the formula just a little bit. Notice that he has not yet handed me any questions. Have you wondered why? Our agreement was, it didn't say we had to, but our agreement was that each one of us for each speech could hand the other six questions in written form. He said that any other question he wanted considered rhetorical. Well, he may have said, consider all of them rhetorical for the answers that I've been getting all of these nights. He hasn't given me any written questions, and again, do you wonder why? Because I might answer in a way that gets him off the track he's already laid down. He couldn't afford to ask me any questions. He might have asked me if I believe that Alexander Campbell restored the Church of Christ. The answer is, no, I don't. Do you believe that Walter Scott restored the Church of Christ? The answer is, no, I don't. Do you believe that Thomas Campbell restored the Church of Christ? No, I don't. Do you believe that Barton W. Stone, Walter Scott restored the Church of Christ? No, I do not. I don't believe that any one man or any four or five men affected what has generally been called the Restoration Movement. Now, he has trouble believing that there was a Restoration Movement but he doesn't have any trouble understanding that there was a Reformation movement that his ecclesiastical daddy came out of. Now, he understands that there was a Reformation movement, and he told us that Reformation was is to restructure the existing entity. I guess that means the Catholic Church didn't exist once you uh, reformed it. So he believes in Reformation, but he will not believe in the restoration movement. He said he believes in restoration, in, in a sort of a restoration, but not the restoration movement. Well, now, if you understand his position, you know why. He couldn't afford to admit restoration when his doctrine says that one who is in Christ cannot fall from the grace of God. 
unless he's changed his doctrine, unless he's some kind of maverick uh, Calvinist. He couldn't believe that you ever went into apostasy. You never go into apostasy, and of course, you never could be restored because you never went into apostasy to be restored from. Now, that's exactly why he is fighting against the idea of the restoration movement. So, well, I still have some questions for him, and some of these that I'll be asking in my first two speeches are those that I presented before that he never get around to, or sometimes, I don't know how it happens, one question is one, one slip of paper, and two-thirds of it will get lost by the time he comes up here. Question number one. Is it your view that from the first century until this present time, there has never been any deviation from the word of God that would require that men make a return to God? Now, we'll wait. Don't hold your breath till he gets around to these questions because he hasn't shown any propensity to do that. Number two, if I read in the Bible that I need to hear the gospel and do so, need to believe the gospel and do so, repent of my sins and do so, and then baptized in obedience to New Testament teaching and do so, would I be lost if I never heard of Alexander Campbell, knew nothing of Restoration history, knew nothing of Reformation history, or of a European history? Must I have heard of the Restoration movement before I could obey those things? He seems to think that the answer is, yes, you must hear of the Restoration movement. And yet all of you know that that's not true. A man can obey the gospel and live faithful and go to heaven and be completely ignorant on all history outside of that which is found in the New Testament of Jesus Christ and then as it relates to the Old Testament. Number three, do you believe the seed is the word of God? He said, yes, I believe that. But notice he never did answer the other part of it. And that this seed can be taken anywhere, any place, any time, and planted faithfully and will produce what God intended. He never did get around to that part. I think maybe it's going to require an operation of God on the heart, really, to get it done. But I'm asking him, that is by his view, I'm asking him if he can take that seed, the Word of God, anybody can take it anywhere, any place, any time, plant it faithfully, and produce exactly what God intended. Then this one. He overlooked this the entire time. I think we've already said enough to indicate why. In men departing from the faith, 1 Timothy 4 and 1, turning from truth, 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, or one person being overtaken in trespass, Galatians 6 and 1, what would be needed for these to be right with God? Now, he's in a little theological dilemma there if he doesn't believe that you can fall from God's grace, then he's got to explain what about this condition in these people. And he'll nearly choke on the word restoring, because, restore them because he doesn't want to say that. The next one, if any matter is New Testament truth, and a man or men centuries later give emphasis to it, are they inventors of truth? Have they invented new truth? Or are they merely stating that which has been there all along. And the next one. He never did answer this one. Mr. Ross, if you went to a mission field where not one soul had heard one word about God, Christ, or the Bible, and you taught them the things you believed and organized them, would you have established Baptist congregations, or would you be the founder of the Baptist church on earth? Now, if he'll answer those, it'll be greatly helpful. Have we lost our messenger? Now, my question's from Mr. Ross, and now please give me his chart 27. I believe that was from a whole my time. You're going to have to make several trips, Bob. Here's chart number 27. Just suppose that we agreed on the teaching of the New Testament on the origin of the church, organization of the church, name of the church, worship of the church, doctrine of the church, and we agreed on the theory. Now, don't tell us that word theory. So you don't believe that you can ever apostatize. We agreed on the theory of church apostasy, yet how could we agree on Thomas Campbell, restoration movement, and all of these things? Well, he's already answered the question of what I said a while ago. I believe if we agreed on those things, we could obey God and live for God. You would have never have to have heard one word about the Campbells or any of these others. If we agreed on those things. Well, he hadn't agreed on one of them yet, apparently, or else 
he did agree and chose not to bring up anything against them. Here's chart number 27. No, 26. Hold my time. Did we steal one of your charts earlier that they're now so far removed? <laughs> Restorers. Book, chapter, and verse for the restoration movement. Now, I want you to notice the depth of Bible knowledge behind that. All of us agree that what he refers to as the restoration movement occurred in the 19th century. Some of it began in England in the 18th century. Now, he wants book, chapter, and verse for these men by name in the Bible. You believe that? He wants me to find the name uh, Restoration Movement, the name Restorationist, the plea restored New Testament Christianity, the Constitution that was mentioned, Declaration and Address, the rule we speak where the Bible speaks, its father, Thomas Campbell. Now, I don't know what version he's reading. You know, we put 30 on the chart in our previous study relating to baptism, he didn't sort of like any of them except he liked the New International Version after they had changed it in some way. Well, he wants one, apparently, that has 19th century and 18th century men named. No, the Bible is not a 18th and 19th century history book, Mr. Ross. Now, maybe you should have asked regarding this idea of restoration, are there any biblical principles there that relate to work that was done here back in the 3rd century, back in the 9th century, back in the 15th century, ahead in the 21st century if it needs it and the world stand? What are some things in the way of Bible teaching that would uh, apply? Well, the rule we speak where the Bible speaks. I gave him 1 Peter 4 and 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. He says that this is a claim for infallibility. There's not an out of difference between that, just the change of wording, than what Peter said. And I asked him, was Peter commanding that we be infallible? I think anyone who's done any study will know that by that slogan, they simply said, we're not going to teach those things as doctrine except the Lord set it forth as doctrine. And what the Lord did not bind as doctrine, then we're not going to bind those things. Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, Brush Run. Imagine he wants to find Pennsylvania in a revelation that ended nearly the 2,000 years ago. He wants to find Brush Run, Pennsylvania. He wants to find ancient gospel. He doesn't like the word ancient. And yet on television, I quoted to him from a Baptist book that said, too bad Luther didn't go all the way back and bring men uh, to see primitive Christianity. Well, now, if he wants to uh, change uh, ancient to primitive, well, let him argue that with Walter Scott. The claim, restoration of movement equals the church. I do not say that, never have said that. Now, let me make this point regarding some other things before we notice the chart or two. Do you remember that Mr. Ross walked over here the other night, and I think it was he addressed about the sixth plank here, and he said, Alexander Campbell never restored anything. Well, now, thank you, Mr. Ross. All that means is, with the charts that I presented on Monday night regarding the Church of Jesus Christ being scriptural in origin, scriptural in organization, scriptural in name, scriptural in worship, and scriptural in doctrine, thank you. I said that all along, that Alexander Campbell didn't start that. And I appreciate the fact that you agree with me. Now, you heard it from the man himself. Besides, you heard it tonight in another way. Or while he rips and rolls through the restoration movement, where did he ever put anything up there regarding the restoration movement and then call for my early charts and say, therefore, this is not right? Where did he ever do that? In fact, let's get to one or two of those right now, Bob, if you will. Look at uh, chart number J34, I believe it is. No, J19. Give me J19. All right, and his proposition is the religious body known as the Church of Christ is of relative recent origination. Now notice, owes its beginning, owes its beginning, its doctrine, its practice, its attributes as a religious body to the efforts and teaching of 19th century reformers such as the Campbells and Scott and Stone. Now, the oldest one of those gentlemen was born in 1763. All I have to do regarding any doctrine any practice, any attribute, 
any feature is just show that it existed before 1763 and he fails in his proposition. Now you ought to word it a better one. If you wanted me to come out and say that these men fully restored the church of Jesus Christ and it was over a brief period of time and no one else in the world was effecting restoration or preaching restoration, it's his fault if he didn't word it any better than he did. But that's exactly what the point. Notice Thomas Campbell, the older one of those, he is saying that from Thomas Campbell and since, all things regarding the church of Christ, its beginning, its doctrine, its practice, its distinctive attributes, certainly had to be before Thomas Campbell was born. Now that's all I have to prove on the, in that regard. All right, chart number 20. Notice when I put this up the other night, the Church of Christ, 1710. He said, oh, I've got the material on that. That was a congregational church. They had their dedication and a congregational preacher by the name of Mather, uh, Mather uh, preached the dedicatory sermon. More than that, it later became a Unitarian church. And more than that, it became a mental health building. Well, it wouldn't make the difference if it became a Texaco service station later on. We're not talking about that. We're talking about in 1710. Now, he handed me some pages saying that that man Cheever became the minister in 1715 and that this congregational preacher addressed them. I'm not responsible for what they did in the five years after this was known as the Church of Christ. I don't know of a congregational church that has Church of Christ as its designation. I know it was recognized by those people back then, and even Massachusetts recognized it in putting up this sign by the name Church of Christ. Now, I'm not saying everything hinges on that, but I'm saying they're that much closer regarding name than Mr. Ross is to being scriptural in the matter. It certainly didn't say Baptist Church, did it? And it certainly didn't uh, say Unitarian, did it? And it certainly didn't say Congregational. Now the next one. That's not all he's got to chew on. Chart J24. How much time do I have? All right. No, I'm sorry. J24A. We'll beat him with that one tomorrow night. J24A. All right. Now let's run through these fairly quickly. And there are copies for him. Here's a history of the Tottle Bank. Baptist Church. What am I doing with that? There's a Tottlebank Baptist Church over in England, and I have a copy of it here. It's published by the Baptists now, giving a history of their congregation all the way back. All right, chart number 25. Now notice that the author of this he begins to say that there is discussion concerning what was the oldest Christian church, he calls it, that was established over in England. He refers to the first Christian church in England, and this man said this, and this man said that. And then he says, refers to the Tottle Bank Church. He says it's been disputed, but he says that there, this was the first church in Furness, was founded as the first Christian church in England. Now notice what he says. By Christian, I mean not congregational, not Presbyterian, not Episcopalian, not Baptist, but simply Christian in its general sense, not sectarian, uh, its unrestricted sense, not sectarian, not Catholic, not denominational. I mean not Baptist is the point that he makes and not any of these others. All right, the next one, chart number 26. And then this especially. That's just the introduction. Then he gets into describing the old minute book of the Tottle Bank Church. This book, and I'm not responsible for the way the English spell things back then. This book is for the use of the Church of Christ. Spells it down. And then the first entry stands the 18th day of ye six month. I don't know how they counted the months. Called August 1669, a church was formed. A church of Christ was formed. Now he's got that to deal with. He hadn't been right on anything thus far in this debate. I don't know why we would expect that he might do any better. 
He said that Campbell restored nothing. Now, what does that mean regarding the charts that I put up on origin, organization, name? He never did. Did he once bring scriptures to bear and say what you've got on this chart is not true? Did he ever pull out anything from the restoration uh, movement, what men said what, that denounced what I put up on those charts, which I will show in my next speech? He said that I distorted Spurgeon on baptism without faith, well, I, or baptism uh, and the matter of faith, or baptismal regeneration. Don't you remember I read to you the exact statement was when Spurgeon condemned baptismal regeneration, he spelled out it was baptism without faith faith and we never have held that position he held up a little yellow sheet and said that he drew this cartoon the southwest church of christ and brethren this is a complete fabrication that here we have rejected some poor half-naked man has nothing on his feet who wants to come into the building he got a holy bible under his arm and there stand the elders authority saying no you can't come in until you get some decent clothes he talked about sideburns and all of that it so happens that because we have a preacher school there and there needs to be some conformity I don't know if you can have any kind of organization without some kind of rules. We do not let these preacher students uh, wear beards and all of that. I believe those who direct the school have a right to say that. Now, he's taking that and applying it to the church. We've got several members right to this good day that have a beard. Now, why does he say that? Well, now, notice what he's got. He's got a man that doesn't even have any clothes on down to his waist. You got people sitting in your congregation, maybe on the first row, stripped naked to the waist. He's saying this is the fellow James 2, verses 2 through 4. It looks like what I can see on Lamar Avenue, a fellow that's smoking like crazy, reeking of alcohol, maybe stinking of drugs, and he says, homeless. And within his sight, there are eight signs that says, help wanted. No, we do not have a rule that forbids someone entering our services if they have a beard. Now, why would a man, when I explained it on television, take that that applies only to the school and say it applies to the church and the elders won't let anybody in the church? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Man, come in your pulpit half naked down to the waist to preach, would you? And I thought, I said, uh, you know, a passage in the Bible, Jesus said something about uh, naked and you wouldn't clothe me. I said, I just wonder if that's old Bill Jackson's church over there that he won't have anyone that can't, can't afford a shirt or a coat and he comes over there and old Bill won't have anything to do with him. So I just thought I'd poke a little fun at him. But now listen, this church and school thing, that's a little more serious. Your own Brother Brown's own, um, what do you call it, uh, catalog. They say that that school is a part of Southwest Church. And the elders over here are the bosses and the rulers and the controllers. And those elders said, sideburns below the lobe of the ear will not be tolerated. Now, are you rebelling against those elders, Bill? You know Thomas Warren, I put him up last night. He said, you rebel against the elders, you're rebelling against God. You're rebelling against God. And those elders said, we'll not tolerate sideburns below the lobe of the ear. And now he's trying to say the school is one thing and the church is another thing. You mean the elders can make laws for the school and those laws are binding and you can violate them and go to hell? But now over here in the church, you can have long sideburns and it doesn't make any difference. That's one of those expediency things, you see. That's one of those things where that the elders can exercise human judgment. And they can say, you schoolboys, you can't have it below the lobe of the ear, but you folks out in the congregation, I guess you can have it down, all running down below the neck a little longer. I don't know how, what those elders are going to dictate on that. But that's, that's your problem, not mine. Now, you can take that one down there, brother. I just wanted to get in that significant thing about his dichotomy here over the school and the church. You listen. You read your own catalog. That school is a part of the church, and it's under the elders. You better learn that. 
you might be on dangerous ground, lose your soul rebelling against the elders. Now put that other chart up here about Alexander Campbell. Uh, he said, uh, well, he didn't believe Alexander Campbell restored the church. Well, somebody did. Somebody did. In the memoirs of Alexander Campbell, which you've quoted here, Henry Clay, a famous American statesman in our government, wrote a letter for Alexander Campbell to take with him to Europe so Campbell could enjoy the facilities with a lot more liberty. He called him the head and founder of one of the most important and respectable religious communities in the United States. And according to Mr. Campbell's memoirs, he took that letter and used it to the enjoyment of the facilities in Europe with a lot more convenience than he would have otherwise. Now what about that? Here's somebody did. Oh, he said, well, he didn't believe Barton Stone or Thomas Campbell or any one of those men. You notice how he kind of wiggled around it? That's what you call a red herring. That's what you call special pleading and begging the question and all kinds of illogical things. Brother Jackson, let's just face up to it now. You and your friends Elkins and Warren and Deaver and all of you believe that the church was restored and Alexander Campbell was the primary leader and all these other men, they had something to do with it somehow. Don't ask me, ask him. He's one that believes this. And I didn't dream this up, ladies and gentlemen. I read all this out of books published by the Gospel Advocate, the Old Pies Book Club, and uh, Firm Foundation, and Spiritual Sword, and whoever else that's been publishing this restoration literature. That's where I got it. I'm just taking Alexander Campbell as a synecdoche, if you please, a representative of the whole bunch. He's the head... He's the head and founder. In fact, Robert Richardson, who wrote this Memoirs of Campbell, you have it lying here on the table, he called him the master spirit. Kind of like Thomas Warren in the McGarry Spiritual Sword cult. He's the head of that cult, so to speak. The tacit head, titular head, or whatever. Now, you, you notice he didn't deal with the issue, though. The issue is, has the church been restored? And if it was restored, who did it? If Campbell didn't do it, if Stone didn't do it, if Thomas didn't do it, if Scott didn't do it, who did it, Bill? You said it's been restored. Who did it? You know why he's dodging this? Because he can't get a church restored without scriptural baptism, and you can't get scriptural baptism according to his doctrine by what Alexander Campbell did. I still ask you again, why didn't Alexander Campbell go to a, one of these churches of Christ you've been flashing up here with these road signs and get baptized? There wasn't one around. There just weren't no church of Christ for Campbell to go to. Boy, if you'd been around with those road signs, you'd been a lot of help to him, wouldn't you? You could have showed him the way to Revere, Massachusetts, and he could have gone up there to those congregational pedo Baptists, and they could have sprinkled him because that's what it was. It was a sprinkling church. I showed it to you last night. Cotton Mather preached the ordination sermon for Mr. Cheever, and I showed it to you, and uh, it was a pedo-baptist, a sprinkling Presbyterian con or congregationalist pedo-baptist church. Then it turned Unitarian. Then it turned Masonic Lodge, and the uh, Historical Society told me now it's used as a mental health institution. Well, I don't know what it would have been by the time Alexander Campbell had come along and Bill would have said, now, Alex, you don't have to go down there to Matthias Luce, that Baptist. Let's go up to Revere, Massachusetts. They got a good church of Christ up there, and it's pastored by Thomas Cheever, and he's a good pedo Baptist preacher. I don't know if he's going Unitarian just yet, but we'll check in on that, and we'll get scriptural baptism for Alexander Campbell, and he won't have to go down there, that Baptist preacher, and Bob Ross won't be able to tell about that later on. Well, I'm, that, I'm glad Bill wasn't up there. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun out of this. He's trying to make a Church of Christ, a bona fide McGarry Church of Christ, out of a road sign. Now, let me give him another one. Get that Mormon church sign up there. Hey, if he can make a church of Christ out of a pedo-Baptist church, a Unitarian Baptist church, or whatever you want to call it, or 
What am I saying Baptist here for? <laughs> Getting carried away. <laughs> He's even making Church of Christ out of Baptist churches, isn't he? But listen, if he can make a Church of Christ out of a Congregationalist church, he can make one out of a Mormon church. Now look at here, Bill. Your old buddy Sidney Rigdon, who was a bosom buddy of Alexander Campbell for a while, he took notes for him when he would de debate it with McCollin, learned that baptism was in order to obtain remission of sins. Then he hooked up with Joseph Smith, and they went over here on 1830 and formed the Mormon church and called it the Church of Christ. Well, now, that's interesting, isn't it? We got a Mormon Church of Christ now. He's got a Congregationalist Church of Christ. He's got a Baptist Church of Christ. He's got a Mormon Church of Christ. But he's not a member of any one of them because he's a member of the one that Campbell started. And that's the Restoration Movement Church of Christ. And you know, he hadn't baptized Campbell yet. He hadn't got him scriptural baptism yet. When you're going to get him baptized, Bill, with some scriptural baptism, you're not a member of the Mormon Church of Christ, are you? You're not a member of the Revere, Massachusetts Congregationalist Church of Christ, are you? You're not a member of the uh, Baptist Church of Christ over there in England, are you? You're a member of the Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, Thomas Campbell, Bar uh, Walter Scott, and on down the line Church of Christ, aren't you? You graduated from David Lipscomb. David Lipscomb was baptized in a box by Tolbert Fanning. Tolbert Fanning was the personal friend and protege of Alexander Campbell from whence he got his doctrine and handed it down to Lipscomb from whence you got it at David Lipscomb College. That's the one you're in. We're not interested in these other churches of Christ. We want the one that you and the spiritual sword write about. Put up that chart Garland Elkins had there, brother, four. Now, here's his buddy, Garland Elkins. He likes him so much he's going to have him speak twice this year at his conference. Oh, excuse me, lectureship, conference sectarian. You're sectarian if you have a conference. That's what I like about these fellows. They don't have revivals. They have gospel meetings. They don't preach the gospel. They preach the ancient gospel. They don't have seminaries and Bible colleges. They have schools of Bible studies. They can't be denominational and sectarian and use sectarian terms. Bunch of hypocrisy, that's all it is. Just like G.C. Brewer said about how you're using the name of the church. Go over there and get G.C. Brewer's track. He said you're making sectarianism out of it. And he's right. Now look here. Elkins, Jackson's friend Elkins asserts infallibility. We speak where the Bible speaks. Therefore, we teach what it teaches. Now let's see what it teaches. Let's have the next one. Elkins claims he teaches what the Bible teaches. And here's what Elkin says the Bible teaches. Our forefathers taught the truth and thus the church was restored. It is true that the plan of salvation, the church, the worship, the organization, etc., have been restored. The leaders of the restoration movement started nothing but rather restored the Lord's church by preaching the gospel, the true gospel. Therefore, the restoration plea is right and there is no doubt that we constitute the church of the Lord. Now that's his buddy Elkins who speaks where the Bible speaks and therefore preaches the truth and he says that these restoration leaders restored the Lord's church and none of these restoration leaders have had scriptural baptism according to this man's doctrine. Now how are you going to restore the church? He said, oh well, Ross didn't like that word. Doesn't matter what Ross likes, it's your problem, not mine. I'm not a member of that church they restored. It's not my problem. I don't have to get them baptized. See, I don't believe all that malarkey that you read in the spiritual sword about. That's where this came from, incidentally. Mr. Shelley, who's denounced all this malarkey, he's left them, finally woke up, got some sense. Mr. Shelley at that time said, the work of God is to be done exclusively by his saved and faithful people and you cannot be saved and faithful unless you have scriptural baptism, according to this man's doctrine, and he can't get a one of them baptized. Now listen, he can take all the Baptist books up here he wants to, but he'll never get Campbell and Scott and Stone baptized with any one of those documents. He can make a church of Christ out of the, what was it, name of that place in England? 
try to make a church of Christ out of a Baptist church? Well, uh, maybe, you know, maybe that's what Campbell was thinking about when he said he should have never left the Baptist. The facts of history reveal that when Thomas Campbell did the work of issuing the restoration plea, he was an unbaptized Presbyterian minister, and you men that study over here at the School of Studies, Southwest School of Bible Studies, Earl West and all these other historians, they'll tell you the same thing. The Campbell, Stone, and Scott were baptized. When they were baptized, they did not know the meaning and the purpose of baptism. It was discovered by Scott in 1827. None of the restoration leaders practiced this for their own remission of sins. Therefore, when did these restoration leaders become the saved and faithful people? His friend Elkins said they restored the church. His friend Hires, Alan Hires, says that the restoration movement is the church. Memphis meeting book. Now, that's, that's the thing he's got to defend, and he can't do it by going to Massachusetts looking for road signs and going to England looking for Baptist books, and even he can't do it with that Mormon book I showed you. He can't do it with his own books. That's why he's dodging around. Ladies and gentlemen, if you know anything about debating, you saw up here tonight, seen up here tonight in him, what's called diversion, trying to change the subject. Now, now here's the answers to your questions. Number one, no. Number two, no. Number three, yes. And on that, I want to say, did, did Alexander Campbell. Number four, no time believe, believe that a believer can fall. Number five, no. Number six, Baptist is not on the proposition. Give me Ross chart number 27, if he used that while ago. No, wait a minute. Give me, give me number 12. Let me go on. I, I can't fool around here with some of this garbage he's throwing up. I'm going to put up some new charts. Look here. Look at this one. Whatever man of the restoration movement or whatever man of today, Mr. Ross may cite, if the utterance is of truth, we indeed, we intend to point to the teaching of the New Testament on the matter. All right, Bill, I flashed Garland Elkins up here on the restoration leaders restoring the church. That's an utterance of today. Now, I want you to tell us if that utterance is the truth. And if not, will you take the adverse of that side and pronounce it false? Let's have number 13, brother, right quickly. Look here at Bill Jackson now. Whatever man of the restoration movement or whatever man of today, Mr. Ross, may cite, if the utterance is of truth, we intend to point to the teaching of the New Testament on that matter. All I have to do is show the point is of the New Testament origin. All right, what more could we ask? If Bill keeps his promise, he will outdo Oral Roberts for miracles. We'll have a new uh, head of the miracle business. What it means is, number one, if the utterance quoted from men of the past and of today is of the truth, then Bill will verify it as of New Testament origin. Now the obverse is, if the utterance quoted from men of the past and of today is not the truth, then Bill will acknowledge that it is not of New Testament origin. For example, if the utterance alleges that men such as Campbell, Stone, and Scott restored the church, such as was alleged by Garland Elkins, yet none of them was ever baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins, then Bill will either defend it by pointing to the New Testament on the matter, else he will acknowledge that the allegation cannot be defended by pointing to the New Testament and quit pointing to a road sign in Massachusetts or to a Baptist over in England or something like that to divert attention and to try to make fun of the Baptists or of the people up in New England or whatever. Now, all, now let's just go on to the next chart, brother. Let's have the next one there. While he's finding that, let me say that what he said concerning the name, he said, well, on that restoration movement chart I had up here, he said, the Bible is not an 18th, 19th century book. Well, now, Bill, you get your name out of the 1611 King James Bible, a mistranslation, word church, Alexander Campbell wouldn't even use it in Living Oracles. And you and your friend Brother Jerry over here, y'all say, oh, we like the word church. Well, King James is one that made them put it in the Bible. He dictated that they do it. And Alexander Campbell came along and wrote an article against it in his magazine called Christian Baptist. He denounced the translation of ecclesia, the Greek word, by the English word church. And Campbell 
published a New Testament called the Living Oracles and he used the word congregation. Now he's the one going to a 17th century book in order to get a name, but he won't give me one up here for restoration movement, which, Ellie, which Alan Hire says is the church. Now why won't he do it? You know why he won't do it. He can't even give a scriptural name for the one he's got. Now, give me the chart, brother. All right, look here. Did he do anything with this? How could we agree that Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, Walter Scott were saved and members of the church? That the restoration movement led by these men restored the church? That these men were loyal to the will of God? What did he do with this? Well, he took a little trip up to Massachusetts and read a road sign. That's all he did. Now let's go on further with our next chart here, brother. He said all he'd have to do is prove is something older than 1763. Well, now is that so? Well, what are you going to prove about your church, Bill, that's older than 1763 that will prove it to be a church? One minute. You can't do it. Now look, here's this restoration movement. Which one is the restored church? We've got all branches of them here chopped up for your benefit. There's the disciples, the Christians, the Church of Christ, David Lipscomb style, the independent Christians, the anti-instrumental music group, the instrumental music group, the anti-orphan home group, the benevolent group, the no-cup group, the no-located preachers group, the located preachers groups, the liberals on divorce, the herald of truth, the image magazine, the truth magazine, and then we've got the blessed spiritual sword over here. And then we've got these fellows down here, Crossroads, Boston, Burke Road, Neo-Calvinism, Garrett Ketcherside, Examiner Magazine, Enzyme Unity Movement, Neo-Charismatic, Premillennialist. Which one of them speaks where the Bible speaks? Which one of them keeps silent where the Bible's silent? All of them say, we are the Restoration Movement, we're the Church of Christ. Which one is it? Well, I know, he's going to say, oh, you Baptists are divided, so I guess that that benefits him on that. Thank you. Well, that was some pretty dynamic debating right there, wasn't it? I, uh, of course, I'm objective and non-biased, but you know, I, I thought Bob did a great job on that uh, particular footage there. <laughs> Hopefully, the viewing audience will agree with me. <laughs> of course, I don't know if they'll believe what I just said about being non-biased here, but uh, uh, it was. First saying, I think. But, uh, Bob, that we got into a lot of uh, interesting stuff there. Church signs from 1710, dress codes, the well, Mormon church know, being I, the I, church of Christ. I've still got up this chart here because I can't get over Bill calling this a faithful congregation of the church of Christ. Uh, yes. And, uh, now, he then, didn't show this up there in, in, to the crowd, did he? This well, he part about the pastor, did he? He didn't emphasize that it had a pastor. He talked more about the church of Christ. It, and, uh, but anyway, uh, you notice here, and yet he so scathingly rebuked the term pastor. Right. Well, with that said, I want to thank you all for joining us today. We'll continue in this debate series next time, same time, same place. So God bless you. Uh, if you need materials, call or write at the address at the end of the show. Thank you. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you.